The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Last time, uh, we were very much uh, dealing with uh, Demia and Cleanthes. And uh, they both come in and out of the dialogue. But the last part of the dialogue is uh, very much given to Philo, the skeptic. And uh, so he gets, he gets to sort of, is there any kind of natural progression here? Do you see a natural progression from, say, uh, the, the pious, pious. Uh, theism of uh, Demia, the sort of experimental theology of uh, Cleanthes, who wants to use you know the mechanisms of the world to prove the existence of God, and the skepticism of Philo. Do you see any kind of progression, or uh, is this the right way to do the dialogue? Yes, well, it ends finally when Philo says that God is um, basically neither good nor bad, and that leaves it on a, like he said, it's God's morally neutral. <coughs> that kind of leaves it open and, like, rather than, like, shifting the discussion towards one extreme where it says that God's evil or something. Like, they touch upon both, like, all the different perspectives, and then finally they just leave it in the middle. Okay. So they start with three. Yeah, at the end, uh, Pampelius, the young man who's sort of uh, sitting there, and he says, who does he vote for? Anybody get to the end, the very end? <laughs> it's, a, it's the end of the last chapter. I, I don't think I asked you to read that, so you probably didn't. Uh, but he votes, yeah, Claire. Oh, for Cleanthes. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's, 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 uh, he's pretty much committed by Cleanthes. So, Almost the middle ground, I guess. Yeah, yeah, so that's uh, the, uh, it's an interesting uh, to have him sort of make the last, you know, conclusion or give him the last word. Because uh, at the end, they all kind of say, eh, just joking, or, or we're just having a, an interesting philosophical discussion. Uh, Demia, of course, gets a little nervous and leaves. Uh, but anyway, we'll come back to that. Okay, so. So, uh, Philo was very definite, um, I mean, at the first, in the first part of this dialogue, he pretty much teams up with, uh, Philo teams up with Demia, with the pious, why, what is it about those two that they have in common? I mean, it's not until toward the end, uh, in, 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 later in chapter seven and, and, uh, toward the end that, uh, Demia says, oh, now your true colors are coming out. That's when he starts arguing about, you know, how badly the world is made. But uh, he and, uh, 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 so Philo, the skeptic, and Demia, the pious uh, theist, theist uh, they sort of team up against Cleanthes. How come? What is it that pious views and skepticism have in common? It has to do with knowledge. Well, I mean, if you are either really pious or really skeptical, in order to make an argument for either one, I feel like you would have to know a certain amount about what you're talking about. Whereas, if you kind of take that middle ground between, it could just be because you don't necessarily have enough knowledge to form a like valid, really strong opinion. So then. Maybe yeah. they they use <coughs> their knowledge, even though they know different things to go against the Andes. Okay, um, um, I think that's you got it. Is is the the um, Demia's position is you know we're just 
poor humans. I mean, what do we know? I mean, our brains are barely capable of understanding their immediate surroundings and so forth. There's no way we can possibly understand the ways of the Creator. So forget about it. Don't try to reason. Don't, your, your reason isn't going to get you there. Reason is not a tool that is of any use in trying to understand deity. So that's, that's the a theistic view that the world is just kind of vastly too complicated for us to really come to a conclusion on the basis of our reason about God. We have to accept God on faith. Faith is it. You, you know. So the skeptic comes in and agrees in, in, in the case of Philo. He, he agrees. Why? Well, Philo also is skeptical about our ability to know things. It's just that his view is, you know, yeah, things are really, really complicated. And, you know, when you start really exploring them, you find out how complicated they are. And the more we learn, oftentimes, the less we, the more we realize we know very little. So the, the skeptic can become uh, a very similar uh, line of thinking to the deist, the theist, because, you know, the skeptic really believes that uh, humans really can't find certain knowledge. They can approximate things, but really understanding the fundamental way in which the universe is organized is, you know, uh, sort of a hopeless project. So these two can kind of talk together and mutually support, and that's why uh, Philo comes in, because they're both going against Cleanthes, who says, no, Cleanthes is an expression of the, the rationalist, the, the great sort of enthusiastic rationalism of the Enlightenment, and you know he's confident. We can really see the way in which God works by understanding the world and the universe because we have our science and our knowledge-based uh, inquiries which can penetrate to very, very far into the, the way the world works and come back with an understanding of its complexity and uh, reason on the basis of that, that this has all uh, been intended. It would have to be intended in order to have design of this kind of uh, effectiveness and, and, and capacity. So, so Philo is now constantly coming up against, he's constantly pointing out that Cleanthes is really not able to make the conclusions he's trying to draw because as he says in this case, uh, this was in the part two which we read last time, he said, you know, it's one thing to talk about a house. We see a lot of houses. When you see another house, we know, oh yeah, somebody built that just like they built all the others. But when we start talking about the universe and saying, well, you know, the universe is way, way more complex and therefore something even, he says, you know, Philo's point is, you know, you can't compare a house and the universe. It just doesn't work. I mean, they're entirely different orders of uh, comparison. So there's a big critique of analogical thinking in, in this work, that analogy works to a degree. But analogy, I think, as you know from various explorations you've had in other contexts. Analogy works up to a point, but when you, when the subjects being compared get too far apart, we have the expression. It's apples and oranges. You know? I mean, at the basis of that is an understanding that analogies only work for classes of objects and considerations that are closely parallel. And Cleanthes' thinking is very, very deeply indebted to analogical principles. He's, uh, I mean, all of it is, you know, based on these grand analogies between complexity at a certain level and complexity at a vast, at a, at a very grand level. So Philo being the skeptic, is constantly trying to understand the basis of knowledge. I mean, that's what he's really interested in. He's, he's offering these reservations, but uh, 
Um, you know, they keep, they keep coming back. So Philo also makes the point, as we mentioned last time, of self-organized matter. And the idea that, um, you know, if you're going to talk about order imposed through a mental process, a spiritual mental process of bringing things into existence as creation would have had to be. His point is, well, if we're arguing that and with as little evidence as we have, we can also argue maybe all this stuff is organized according to internal principles that you know, are simply you know, not known to us, but it's no more speculative to say that than to say that you know, some divine power through uh, some kind of mental process brought the world into existence. What, what is the mechanism for moving across those kinds of categories from spiritual supernaturalism to material-based earth? That's a big jump across. Of course, the argument is anything is possible with you know, uh, uh, a deity. But uh, Philo's point is it's no more absurd to say that things are organized through an internal principle than through some external. In fact, he says his view is it's a little, it's a little more rational, or I'm not sure if we should use the word rational here. We could give that to Cleanthes, but it's a little more plausible that things may be self-ordered. Why is he saying that? Why does he hold the view that it's, it's at least as, and maybe more likely that things are organized through internal principles of self-organization than through some intervention of a deity? He, but he really gives no, from what I remember, he doesn't give much of a real explanation as to how the self-organizing principle works. The closest I think he gets, which is reason by analogy, is the whole, you know, it's from the seed comes the tree and from the tree comes another tree, you know, which is all fine, but it doesn't seem to cover the dust off, you know, the, the, the real treasure. He's, he's, quite, he's quite aware that he's on, you know, as shaky a ground. All he's saying, in, in essence, is we're keeping it in the natural order, the explanations in the natural order, if we say that there's some natural principle, but he doesn't have a ghost of a clue what that natural principle is. And, you know, even Darwin, when he started arguing, he didn't really know what was happening at the cellular level. Well, he sort of described uh, natural selection and so forth, but when it came to, you know, the micro explanation of that. He had a few odd theories, uh, but you know he was speculating too. So yeah, um, he doesn't know. So in part five, uh, Philo continues his attack on on uh, the anthropocentric. So one of the things that uh, both Philo and Demia accuse Cleanthes of is anthropomorphism. What is anthropomorphism? Why is, it, why is it being attributed to Cleanthes by these two others? Yeah. Is this uh, the thought that well, Cleanthes always makes an analogy of uh, a godly entity with a earthly object and how earthly objects are made with purpose and design through human uh, human reasoning and how God therefore must also use that same reasoning um, okay. to create the world. Okay. So so, so he's he's using the sort of um, craftsman, craftsperson model of, you know, this is the way the world was made by a great supernatural person who pretty much works the way we do which strikes Demia and Philo as kind of odd to start with humans and then <laughs> arrive at, 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 at deity. I mean, for Demia, it's like sacrilege, profane, to say, you know, this deity is just like us. 
and therefore that's what he uses, this uh, anthropomorphite. That's what they call Cleanthes. And Philo also. Also, this sense that uh, the world is beautiful and perfect. We've heard this before, haven't we? From Pangloss, the crazy philosopher, uh, who said it's the best of all possible worlds. You know, things are all done for a purpose, and if you happen to be in the wrong place and you suffer pain or whatever, you know, you can be consoled by the fact that you know the greater purpose is being served. And you know, true, you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, but you know, most other things weren't. And so, if you get back far enough and you see the world in the way it works, it's it's got this. Uh, sense of perfection to it. So again, this is, um, and then he says rather cheekily, if you will, at the end of the uh, chapter, he says, in a word, this is Philo talking, in a word, Cleanthes, a man who follows your hypothesis is able perhaps to assert or conjecture that the universe sometime arose from something like design. But beyond that position, he cannot ascertain one single circumstance and is left afterwards to fix every point of his theology by the utmost license of fancy and hypothesis. You see what he's saying here is, you know, okay, let's say it uh, by design, but once you say that's true, how? <laughs> it's like, who knows? And then he says, this world for aught he knows is very faulty and imperfect compared to a superior standard, and was only the first rude essay of some infant deity, who afterwards abandoned it ashamed of his lame performance." So this, of course, offends uh, Demia, but uh, you know, he, uh, the, the point is, is, you know, if this world is not that perfect a world, I mean, if we can imagine better worlds that could be constructed, uh, then maybe if the deity constructed the world, the deity was sort of young and needed practice, and this just happened to be one of those worlds that spun off and you know, it didn't quite work. So he's cracking open this, this, this case about how perfect is the world. I mean, once Cleanthes has made this big point about this, this absolutely gorgeous, ravishing machine, you know, he's kind of stuck in this corner. He's painted himself into a corner of sorts. Because now you can say, well, okay, how perfect is it? And that's where the thrust of a lot of this end of this, this, this book, um, that, that's the thrust of the end of the book, is sort of moving into this direction of, how perfect is the world? What kind of world do we live in? Uh, could there have been better worlds? Um, what are some of the problems we find in the world? Uh, and so on and so forth. And if there are problems in a world and so forth, was the DT benevolent but not completely competent? Or was the DT competent but not quite benevolent? I mean, one or the other. If you know, you have to come to these, uh, so this is, this is definitely the direction that he's moving in. So let's say that this world is a great perfect entity. Uh, Philo then makes the point about the shipbuilder. What, 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 what was this point? That, that the ship was built through trial and error, what works and what doesn't. It wasn't just all of a sudden created and was perfect the first yeah. time. So why, why would Earth be any different from, say, the ship? Precisely, precisely, yeah. I mean, the Earth, Earth as we know it now uh, supports life and so on. Did it always support life? Well, <laughs> no. Uh, of course, that's adding new knowledge to, uh, Hume didn't know that. But, uh, you know, the notion of, you know, life on the earth as something that was just put there, uh, that's certainly subject to other kinds of explanations. Um, and so he brings in this whole shipbuilder notion. The ship is this great, perfect, wonderful thing 
I don't know, use your own metaphor, uh, the Ferrari, okay, the Ferrari. Where'd the Ferrari start? Well, it started way back with a steam engine and some two cycles and, you know, it didn't look like a Ferrari. Uh, people have been working on cars forever and they keep trying to change them and improve them and make them better and better and, you know, think of all the technologies we have that have delivered the capacity we have. None of those were just kind of invented out of uh, nowhere. They've all emerged through constant interaction and improvement and incremental development. So this notion of incrementalism as a source <coughs> of greater degree of perfection is being introduced here. And of course, incrementalism is profoundly important to Darwin's style of thinking, is it not? I mean, so we're getting into this, this species of thinking about objects, complicated objects, as things drawn out over ages. So the ship is an absolutely brilliant example. These great clipper ships that were, you know, state-of-the-art, uh, moving around the world for good and evil. Uh, but, you know, these are things that uh, had not simply been invented. They had been, and uh, my only problem with this, this passage here is the word stupid in front of mechanic. I, I never thought of mechanics as stupid. Uh, mm -hmm. Mechanics uh, oftentimes know a lot more than, you know, the people are doing the sort of the grand design. So, uh, but nevertheless, he's, his point is, is, you know, it's, it's somebody, if you ask the mechanic how to make the ship, the mechanic can't tell you. Doesn't know. I just do this part of it. You know, I, I seam. I, I put the seam. Uh, you know, I, I uh, cock the seams, or I do. I, I build the mast, or I make the sails, or I, you know, think of all the thousands of things that go into building a ship. Nobody sat down one night and said, "Okay, I'm going to design this thing." Uh, you know, from scratch. Okay, so he says. Um, Many worlds might have been botched and bungled throughout the eternity ere this system was struck out. Much labor lost, many fruitless trials made, and a slow but continued improvement carried on during infinite ages in the art of world making. This would strike uh, uh, Demia as, you know, highly sacrilegious and profane. But, you know, we are in a discussion here trying to look at what the possibilities are, and that's what the point of Hume's discussion is, is open us up to the ways in which we can think about the world. Open the mind up, you know. Think about the possibilities, a range of possibilities. You know, he's not, not trying to make you think. And you, you, can, you can choose your, you can pick your object. Is this speaker like some kind of polytheism or? Like in the last part of that yeah. shipbuilder argument, yeah. is yeah, the. Uh, it seems to say like a lot of people work. Yeah, he says in one passage. He says, well, maybe a lot of gods worked on the world. You know, maybe the world was, you know, kind of a collective enterprise among deities. Several of them got together and sort of made up the different elements of the world and so on and so forth. And uh, yeah, so you could use that as, you know, uh, uh, if, you, if you wanted to for that kind of an argument. I don't think he's serious about it, but he's just trying to point out that, you know, you can think about a lot of different ways in which the world could come into existence. Okay, so unnecessary complexity. Is this a, uh, is this something that, uh, uh, that uh, Philo is suggesting? Does the world, is the world unnecessarily complex? Well, it's, so, a, it's, it's an interesting question. I know the Rube Goldberg machines, I'm sure you've all seen, and they're immensely charming. Uh, but uh, the fact that the world seems to o operate in ways that might not operate if it were designed precisely for its purpose. The notion that it may be more complex than it need be. I think there's this kind of dialogue underneath 
some of Philo's speculations here. That, yeah, we have pain and we have pleasure and, you know, we have general laws and so forth, but, uh, you know, if, if an ideal person or ideal deity were building the world, maybe it'd be a little simpler and a little less painful and so forth. So underneath here is some notion of mechanism and constraint. And that's a very powerful idea within Darwin that, you know, evolution in Darwin's view you can't work like God and just do the thing that the species needs. Evolution is constrained, is it not? How is it constrained? It's limited by the mutations that occur. By the mutations and the subjects matter that they have to work with. Evolution works with, with what exists. And, you know, so uh, 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 a bladder in some ocean organism emerges in a land organism as a lung. But, you know, the fact that, you know, evolution is constantly uh, as a process, incremental process, is constantly working with whatever the materials that are available. You can't create new materials. It doesn't, it's not like a designer in a laboratory or a workshop who says, oh, I need, I need this, and I'll put this wheel here, and I'll put this here, you know, so forth. That seems to be Cleanthes' model for the universe, is it was made like a clock. And, you know, somebody just put it all together in a workshop, quite a workshop. Whereas the notion behind evolution, and Philo is beginning to explore this terrain, is there are incredible constraints here. All organisms are under phenomenal pressure, phenomenal constraints. And, um, you know, they basically function just barely as well as they need to in order to survive. Okay. So then, of course, his uh, part 70 gets into his, uh, he really likes this, this notion of vegetative universe. Of course, as, as you said, he doesn't have a ghost of an idea exactly how this works either. But at least he's keeping the order of explanation, you know, in a band of explanation that we all kind of accept as a uh, natural world. Uh, I mean, cosmos is a little bit out there. We don't know a whole lot about that all the particulars of the cosmos, but, you know, we know that we're part of it. The Earth is part of it. Newton's laws, as we said before, sort of extended the explanation and the sort of principles of physical existence into the heavens. So the notion that uh, this physical law extends beyond uh, and Newton, others did before Newton too. I mean, even Copernicus, they're sort of working on principles of natural explanation. And that goes all the way back to early, early Greek thought, this whole spirit of naturalism. Okay, so he says the world plainly resembles more an animal or a vegetable than it does a watch or a knitting loom. Its cause, therefore, it is more probable, resembles the cause of the former. The cause of the former is generation or vegetation. The cause, therefore, of the world we may infer to be something similar or analogous to generation or vegetation. As he says, the effects of these principles are all known to us from experience. But the principles themselves and their manner of operation are totally unknown. But that's okay. I mean, there are people who are going to look at these uh, questions. Some of them, uh, you know, uh, this, this book uh, was really just, uh, just before the development of uh, uh, astronomy. The Herschels, the two Herschels who uh, developed uh, modern concepts of astronomy, the expanding universe and so on and so forth, and took 
astronomical speculation to a much more detailed and higher level of uh, understanding. And, you know, the, uh, many of the things uh, that they showed was that we can learn more and more and more about the way the cosmos works. We can't learn more and more and more about how the great clock of the universe came into existence from in the lab of in the lab of the uh, of, of God. So you know, there's a uh, there's a possibility of scientific exploration in one direction, but in the other direction, that possibility is really barren. There's not a whole lot you can look into. So. Nor is it less intelligible or less conformable to experience to say that the world rose by vegetation from a seed shed by another world than to say that it rose from a divine reason or contrivance, according to the sense in which uh, Cleanthes understands. Okay, and then he. Okay, so this is this is where we arrive um, um, in in uh, leading up to. Um, the last, the last section. Uh, I mean, there, there's a lot in the book, and we could probably spend the whole term working on this book if you were so inclined. Uh, Hume's a, a great thinker and a generous thinker. He gives everybody a very solid representation. You can say, well, he favors Philo, but uh, he does give Philo the last sort of section. So I've always thought myself, yeah, he's sort of giving him the, the best parts. On the other hand, uh, he certainly gives a, a, a good run for Cleanthes. And he deeply respects, I'm, I'm convinced, uh, the speculations of uh, Demia, or, or not speculations, because Demia doesn't like to speculate. He, the belief and the pious faith. Okay, so <coughs> in uh, <coughs> part 11, we're jumping to the uh, end here, but these are sections that are of importance to us in our exploration here of this term. Um, he comes to this question. Uh, what would we expect from a powerful, wise, benevolent deity who is making a world? What, what, what would we expect? And he comes, he's devoted the chapter before this on sort of a short chapter on the persistence of misery and how miserable humans are, you know, the fact that they've got illnesses and they're I mean, humans have had the plague, they've had, you know, I think probably today we may not really be in a good position to appreciate what life was like in the mid-18th century. It was not quite like our, you know, suburban life and our, you know, uh, moderate level of uh, affluence, which some people see diminishing these days, but nevertheless, uh, compared, to, compared to the average person and access to health care and nutrition and so on and so forth, kings and queens really didn't uh, have the options that we have. There was a lot of, you know, moderately miserable condition to human living. Uh, and a lot of very strikingly, uh, striking misery. Lots and lots of really, really poor people. Um, so, you know, when he talks about this section, it has a little more impact at that time. Now, we could ask if today, you know, have we emerged out of that period of all this pain and so forth, and maybe at last we've, uh, that, that's that accidental world of, um, of uh, Voltaire, you know which I think most people thought was a little overdone, but <laughs> nevertheless pointed out to some serious truths. Okay, so he says uh, the, the, for the persistence of human misery 
and he, he points out that, uh, Philo points out that there are f what he calls four circumstances of evil. And the first is pain. What about pain? Well, he says that pain is unnecessary if, like, all it's trying to get you to do is to <coughs> not do things that cause pain. Like, it teaches you to stay away from things, but, so it's kind of like, um, it's like a punishment, correction kind of factor. And he proposes that if we just had pleasure and more pleasure, then people would naturally stay away from the things that do not give them that much pleasure, or like just slight discomfort. Um, okay. Yeah. He says, uh, okay, so he says the first circumstance which introduces evil, we can, we can discuss the meaning of evil, um, is that contrivance or economy of the animal creation. Uh, pay attention to language here, because this, this notion of an economy, why is he using the word economy? He's spelling it O-E, uh, but it's, it's the word economy. He says, the first circumstance which introduces evil is that contrivance or economy of the animal creation by which pains as well as pleasures are employed to excite all creatures to action and make them vigilant in the great work of self-preservation. How about that? Economy and self-preservation. Why is he referring to uh, economy? David. Uh, it kind of reminds me of survival of the fittest almost. So like, okay. Um, it's com there's competition, and they're always trying to one's always trying to outdo the other. Uh, <coughs> yeah, uh, Darwin used the word economy in in in, in the art. So what is an economy? Why do we use the uh, word economy for the situated nature of living beings? Yeah, first and foremost, I think it needs to be an environment with limited resources. Okay. And so it's um, different aspects of the economy of making decisions based on those limited resources. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, there are limited resources. Uh, things are trying to stay alive, and there is a certain amount of, you know, as he says, uh, the great work of self-preservation. This is, you know, suggests economy, great work of self-preservation. You know, there's a context in which things vie for self-preservation. And this is... Uh, this is uh, driven partly, he says, or, or regulated partly by pain. How else could it be regulated? Jennifer. Uh, that's like what he argued, how else? Yeah, 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 yeah. By like just not having pleasure, but like um, in, instead of... He was saying that, like... He was saying that you could just use pleasure instead of pleasure and pain. Yeah. Is that... Any, any opinions on whether that would work? Mm -hmm. I feel like it's all relative, and if you did it that way, then less pleasure would be equivalent to pain, wouldn't it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Or deprivation of some sort. And pain it comes in many forms, doesn't it? It comes as, you know... Uh, pain is a kind of, uh, it, it can, yeah, pain is be pretty hard word to define, actually. It's, it ranges all the way from mild discomfort to intense suffering. And, uh, you know, across this whole realm of uh, experience, we see a lot of things. So, yeah, you could, you could make that argument. Yeah, Jacob. So if you lose pain, you lose part of your spectrum, like you're just saying about how it ranges. If you have just positive feedback, you don't know the difference between something that neither hurts nor helps you mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. something that does hurt you a lot. 
Whereas yeah, yeah, it, it would be interesting, interesting spe speculation to imagine a world in which uh, just degrees of pleasure. Because maybe, maybe in some sense, if we just had degrees of pleasure without any pain, we wouldn't think of it as pleasure. Maybe the two things are, exist in opposition to each other. This, this notion of the proportion of pain and pleasure in our lives, you know, it's an interesting question. But certainly the capacity for pain and the capacity for intense pain is there. And uh, that's part of what he's arguing is, you know, is that capacity really needed? The deity was really concerned about us. Would, you know, these wars and all these sorts of things be things that we would be the inventors of? Um, so he, he, he designates this the first of the four circumstances of evil. The second one is operation by general laws. What does he mean here? Operation by general laws. How could it be different? <laughs> could we have special laws uh, organized for each? Uh, Charles would have his own set of laws, and Devin would have another set, and Claire would have another set, and they would all operate. Uh, so what does he mean by operation by general laws? Why is this something that... Uh, Physics, yeah, 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 okay, basic, basic physics, physics of uh, space and motion, motion and things of that sort. Uh, they don't, you know, work according to our individual, we don't have our own private little world of laws to live in. Uh, I always found this uh, kind of an odd argument, because <laughs> I couldn't imagine what uh, the alternate would be. But he says, a being, therefore, who knows the secret springs of the universe might easily, by particular volitions, turn all these accidents to the good of mankind and render the whole world happy without discovering himself in any operation. A fleet whose purposes were salutary to society might always meet with a fair wind. Good princes enjoy sound health and long life. Persons born to power and authority be fam framed with good tempers and virtuous dispositions uh, goes on. So <clears throat> there seem to be a lot of laws that we have to adapt to. Nature is, you know, as, as we were saying before, nature is the realm of natural law, the way in which it operates, and our position in nature, you know, we contend with it. It's, it's, there's a struggle there. Arguing for the consistency of good and evil, like for example, the the fact that no matter how many times there's an earthquake, the earthquake always seems to be a bad thing. Whereas in the opposite case, where one time you have an earthquake and it ruins the town, the next time it causes all the all the caves on the mountain to open up and gold comes for or whatever, you know, yeah. diamonds come pouring out. Like, is that all? Is that what the argument's about? Or I'm not quite sure I'm following it. Uh, he's. I think the former that that you know the the way in which we experience catastrophes is always when we somehow find ourselves in the midst of large physical forces. Uh, and those physical forces can be described in a variety of ways that we have no control over. And so, you know, like in the great, you know, winds we get caught up in and earthquakes, as you say, and so forth. Uh, and rarely do they turn out to be for the good, but it is, it is conceptually possible that they would. You know, an uh, earthquake might take place and bring in water to the inland that you could then use for your farms and things of that sort, but uh, usually it's the opposite. Mudslides, uh, people getting buried, uh, people getting caught in hurricanes, uh, things of this sort, and the fact that these are all just part of natural law. I mean, they're just things that happen in nature. They're consistent. They're part of the natural world. And so our fit with the natural world, is what he's really saying, is not that good. Yeah, you know, if we, now, now we know humans and their history, and there were hunter-gatherers, and there were farms, and you know, all uh, agricultural societies, and you know, there was a steady growth into the cities, and so on and so forth. Uh, but through all that history that we know, uh, the fit of humans with their environment has not been that great. 
and we're experiencing it now. You know, we talk endlessly about climate change, and that's going right to his point about natural law, because climate is, in some sense, the natural, uh, <coughs> natural existence of our lives. I mean, this is what we exist in. And as that changes, we have to scramble to try to figure out how to live within that context. So, yeah, we are humans with expectations and consciousness who find themselves kind of in nature someplace and trying to figure out how to adapt to it. So that, in, in some sense, is the human project, is to adapt better to nature. I mean, if a deity can simply change everything, has infinite capacity, couldn't a deity just constantly be shifting the... I mean, it's kind of an absurd argument, but, but you know, he's, it does draw out the fact that we do live in these uh, contested uh, spaces of existence, if you will. Okay, so operation by general laws. The parsimony of powers and faculties. What's he talking about here? We not only exist in this content, contended space, but humans, yeah. Charles. Well, like, we don't have wings, we don't have fur, we don't have claws. Like, we don't have a lot of things that could make us a lot better off in nature, but we do have some things that other animals don't. Yeah, we, we, we have, um, we certainly have a, um, uh, a capacity to reason. Uh, he says here, uh, in short, nature seems to have formed an exact calculation of the necessities of her creatures. That's a pretty observant statement. Uh, and like a rigid master has afforded them little more powers or endowments than what are strictly sufficient to apply those, to supply those necessities. An indulgent parent would have bestowed a large stock in order to guard against accidents, secure the happiness and welfare of the creature in the most unfortunate concurrence of circumstances. So this is uh, a famous sculpture called the Dying Gaul, but what do you notice? I mean, humans, you know, aren't that impressive uh, when it comes to their, you know, their physical. I mean, everything, of course. I mean, they are impressive in many ways, obviously, and especially in their 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 mental capacities and so on and so forth. But you know, look how frail this figure is. Couldn't humans have been uh, developed with a little more capacity, a little more ability to? furnish their needs, to avoid the pain and suffering, or to adapt to the natural powers or whatever. You know? So the existence of general laws and the integration of that with the frail human, I mean, you can see what's building up here is, is a picture of, uh, you know, incremental change or incremental uh, uh, scaled ability. Okay, now, again, I don't want to be ahistorical about this, but Darwin comes into this, and you can see where a lot of Darwin's thinking is when he's thinking about organic beings. Everything in Darwin's system of natural existence is in the same situation, humans included. They all have something, but just enough to get into the next generation. So, yeah, there's a lot of, for all its abundance, there's tremendous parsimony in, in natural existence. And finally, uh, this seems to me close to general laws, operation of general laws, but uh, it's what he calls inaccurate workmanship. In some sense, he's coming back to his, you know, contradiction of uh, 
Cleanthes, great beautiful machine of, of, of the universe. He's saying, you know, this is a great beautiful machine. It's not that beautiful when you look at it more closely. It's got lots and lots of problems. And so um, he says, the four circumstances which arises, uh, whence arises the misery and ill of the universe is the inaccurate workmanship of all the springs and principles of the great machine of nature. It must be acknowledged that there are few parts of the universe which seem not to serve some purpose and whose removal would not produce a visible defect or disorder in the whole. The parts all hang together, nor can one be touched uh, without affecting the rest in a greater or less degree. But at the same time, it must be observed that none of these parts or principles, however useful, are so accurately adjusted as to keep precisely within those bounds in which their utility consists. And so he goes on, uh, uh, thus the winds are re requisite to convey the vapors along the surface of the globe and to assist men in navigation, but how often, rising up to tempests and hurricanes, do they become pernicious? Rains are necessary to nourish all the plants and animals of the earth, but how often are they defective? How often excessive? Heat is requisite to all life and vegetation, but it is not always found in due proportion, and so on and so forth. We have lots of complaints. I mean, you know, we can, we can always find things to complain about, but um, this is uh, the fourth of his, his accounts, or his, uh, what he calls his uh, circumstance of evil. And in this, his effort to ultimately uh, counter Cleanthes' uh, natural theology as being even vaguely valid. So, it's, uh, okay, so, what do you think of the three? Are they, <laughs> I suppose I'm coming out as a Philo uh, fan. Uh, I always liked Philo personally. Uh, he's a skeptic, and I don't know, there's something about his, but I have to say uh, Cleanthes is, is impressive, and, and so is Demi in his own way. Uh, they all have... Uh, their views of the world. Do you think these views now are pretty much old, old you know, uh, are these things that we've moved beyond? Or do they still exist among people in our contemporary society? And is there a fourth view that I've missed, that, that Hume has missed? You like Hume. Yeah. I'm a fan too. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm I think they definitely still apply all of the different views. Just, just the fact that like we still are choosing ones who we agree with, and the fact that we can't count. We, I mean, if we were involved in a debate with these three philosophers, I don't feel as though we would have the answers to counter everything yeah. that they were saying or to completely agree. Yeah. So I think they're definitely still applicable just because we don't have those answers yet. Yeah, I mean, any one of us in this room, if we were sitting in a room with any one of them, would probably lose the argument. Because yeah. <laughs> they're, all, they're all pretty savvy about what they know. And yet, when you see them together, you think, whoa, they're, you know, they really represent quite a broad spectrum of, uh, of, of, of views. Um, you know, and, and uh, so, but certainly there are many, many people in contemporary culture, certainly here and elsewhere in the world, who would line up with uh, Demia in a pious view of uh, the world as the result of the creation. I'm not so sure how many people would line up with Cleanthes. Uh, you know, that was a, a sort of... <coughs> Uh, natural theology came out as an expression of the uh, of the Enlightenment among many of these scientists who still believed very strongly in God, but also knew that science was a very powerful approach to experience, and so they wanted to somehow find a scientific basis for arguing the existence of God. And we'd have to put Newton in there, we'd have to put Ben Franklin in there, we'd have to put Joseph Priestley, and many other people, and probably Charles Darwin at the start of his career. 
pretty close to the way uh, a really intelligent, rational believer would, would think. And then finally, philo. Philo, you know, is just a skeptic. And a lot of people are scared of skepticism. Just, you know, wow. He doesn't, <laughs> he thinks the world is, you know, uh, badly designed by uh, infinite deities. So there, there, there's a level of not only skepticism, but, uh, you know, um, I don't know, uh, there's a level of uh, uh, sort of uh, atheism, if you will. And so, you know, he's, he's problematic for a lot of people. At the end, how does it end? Well, Hamphilius, uh, he, uh, he votes for Cleant. He thinks Cleanthes has made the best case. And they all kind of get back together and say, you know, this is, a nice, this is a nice discussion. We should have more of these. And uh, so, you know, it was very, offered very much by Hume as something that, you know, he just wanted to put out there as different approaches. And it's, it's a, in my view, a, a, an amazing work. It's, it's complex and dense, but it's an amazing piece of work.